Mayor, how are you? Hey, Dr. Robinson, how are you? Doing well. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedule to talk with us today. Um, we have some very energetic students and also some faculty and, okay. and, uh, and staff who are, are excited about uh, hearing from you today and your experiences here at the University of Arkansas. Uh, just want to give you a brief introduction so that the students have some sense of who you are. Uh, mayor George McGill is the uh, mayor of the great city of Fort Smith. And uh, he is the first African-American mayor of the city of Fort Smith and is doing a great job with that city. Uh, he has he served in the Arkansas State Legislature and has numerous awards and recognitions for the work that he's done, the community service that he's performed. And so we're, we're just thrilled, uh, Mayor, to hear about your experiences when you were here at the University of Arkansas and any thoughts that you have on uh, contemporary protests. And, 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 and we want to leave if you you would allow some time for the students to raise questions because I'm sure they would, they'll have questions for you. So without any okay. further ado, Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me first say congratulations to you, Dr. Robinson, for, uh, I think I got the word correctly that uh, you're gonna be the provost. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, academic sir. affairs and student affairs and I congratulate you and uh, very, very proud of you. We've known each other for a long time. And, we have. Yes, and, sir. And the other thing, thank you for allowing me some space in, in your book uh, with you and Dr. Williams. Yes. Uh, yes that uh, my family loves to hear those stories. <laughs> uh, okay. But welcome to all of you. And uh, it's, it's an honor for me to be with you. Um, and so... They've sent me a list of questions that you may want to ask, but let me first say that uh, when I first went to the University of Arkansas, uh, the experience sent all of us reeling. <laughs> we didn't know <laughs> what to expect. Uh, and we, we were reeling from the, the pain and confusion that we faced when we first set foot on the campus. Um, I stepped foot on the campus in the fall of 1964. Uh, a little backdrop to that. It was on July the 2nd, 1964, that I gained full rights as an American citizen. That meant I could go anywhere now. I, no one could stop me from going into a public place. Up until that time, I experienced what it was like to have uh, water fountains that said colored and white restrooms designated likewise. Uh, so uh, I was excited about the times that, that now I can go to the University of Arkansas uh, and, and, and participate in a grand. Needless to say, when I arrived on campus, the laws had changed, but the policies had not changed. My first semester on campus, I was not allowed to live in the dormitories. And that kind of caught me off guard because I was looking forward to the dormitory experience. So all of the African-American students, we, we lived in the black community. Uh, some of you may be familiar with St. James Baptist Church. It was on Willow Street. And most of us lived in that area in and about St. James Baptist Church. A few of us lived near campus, but not on campus. Uh, again, we were uh, shocked, confused by what we thought would be an amazing experience. Now, it was a culture shock, not only for African-American students, because most of us had come out of segregated high schools. Uh, I went to the Lincoln High School in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Uh, I always call it one of the great high schools. Um, at Lincoln High School, we had a culture of excellence. That was the focus, excellence in everything we did, from the choir to the student body, to the science club, to the, to the uh, business club. Everything was driven by excellence. 
our, our teachers and, and, and those that gave us instruction impressed upon us that we must be very good, perform excellently wherever we go because we would be at a disadvantage simply because of our skin color. So we bought into that. So our culture was one of excellence. Uh, I never will forget when I, uh, in my first English class, English and literature class, and the professor was talking about the Canterbury, tale, Canterbury Tales and Chaucer. And he asked the class, how many of you have heard of that? How many of you recognize the name Chaucer, Jeffrey Chaucer? And my hand was the only one that went up. And the professor looked at me um, as if it just gave me this strange look and said in a tone that was that bothered me as an 18 year old, he says, what do you know about the Canterbury Tales and Chaucer? And I told him what I knew and he said to me, where did you learn that? As if it made him feel a certain way. He said, where did you learn that? And I told him I came from Lincoln High School in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and that we had studied the Canterbury Tales and, and, and all of these things. And he had a disgusted sound in his voice because my hand was the only one that went up. Excuse me. Uh, and it was situations like that. It was, it was like we were in a foreign land uh, because coming out of a segregated uh, high school uh, and in Fort Smith, we were segregated in just about everything we did. So going to the University of Arkansas, hitting that campus. At the time, I think there were close to 14,000 students on campus. And if I recall, there was a close-knit group of us that counted for about 18 to 20 people at the most. And we became a very close-knit family. Uh, at the time, out of that 20 people, there were only three of us that had vehicles. And we turned them into community vehicles. We shared those vehicles with all the other students. Uh, that were there on campus. So it was an experience that 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 shaped us uh, and it prepared us for the world we were going to face. Not long after that, a year or so on campus was the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And it was as if all of our hope had been ripped away uh, from us because there was a struggle for justice, equality, and equity on the campus. And we banded together and made a determination that we were going to stay at the University of Arkansas in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the challenges that we, that we faced in the classroom that was separate and distinct from anyone else. Many of our professors, did not care about the fact that we were there and in the classroom. In fact, I had one professor ask me, why was I in a class? Took a microbiology class and he had the nerve to ask me, what are you doing here? And I politely told him that I was interested in becoming a doctor. And he did, again, gave me that look of disdain uh, that was often troubling. Um, but at the end of the day, it helped shape, uh, helped shape me, um, it, you know, made us tough. Uh, and I think even more importantly, we braided ourselves together as a unit. And we work, worked very hard to make sure that we all succeeded. And as, as I look back over those times, I reflect on some of the classmates and friends that I made during that period of time. One of them is still a very dear friend of mine, my fraternity brother. Uh, Professor Gerald Jordan, uh, very instrumental in, in driving change on campus um, during those tumultuous times. And we made great strides, made, made great changes at the University of Arkansas, and we pressed for those changes, and we fought for them, and we spoke out about 
what was right and, and how we should be treated. And over time, the university relented and began to understand the value of having us there. But at the end of the day, we were determined to stay. Uh, we were not going to leave. And we stepped in and, and assisted one another with classwork, uh, resources. Every now and then, someone needed to go home in case of an emergency. We didn't have a lot. They didn't have the financial programs that they have today. So we struggled along the way. Again, we banded together and made sure that we all managed to get through. Uh, one of the questions they asked me was, uh, what inspired me to, first of all, go to the University of Arkansas? I had a brother attend the University of Arkansas in 1958. Uh, Donald W. McGill uh, was a great football player in Fort Smith in, in, in Arkansas. And was, needless to say, he played in segregated schools. They played against Horace Mann and, and Little Rock and uh, Pine Street and Pine Bluff. All of these were African-American schools. And he was recognized as one of the great running backs. And he wanted to go to the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. And he did not on scholarship, but he was going to walk on. He knew he, if he ever walked on that field, they let him on the field, he was going to make the team. When he went there, Frank Broad told him that he could not play because they didn't have black athletes on that team at that time. I admired him for his courage. That did not discourage him. He accepted Frank's explanation about why he didn't have black athletes and why my brother couldn't play, but my brother stayed at the University of Arkansas and earned his degree in microbiology and went on to have a distinguished career in the United States Air Force, uh, where he served as a missile command, missile base commander, uh, served up on the North Korean border and uh, had a distinguished career in education. So that was the reason I wanted to go. I wanted to follow in my brother's footsteps, but he never told me of the hardships that he faced. He never told me about the racism and the harsh words that he experienced almost daily. He never shared that with me. And he always told me that if you want to go to the University of Arkansas, you will get a great education. And needless to say, when I arrived there, then I, was, uh, I experienced some things that I never thought I'd experience. It was not unusual to hear the, to hear the N word uh, as we walked across campus going to and from class. It's quite common. As a matter of fact, it's quite common. But I did go to the University of Arkansas uh, and, and I stayed. Coming full circle, I went back and earned a, a master's degree. At the time, little did I know that I was the first African American to enter the, the master's program to even think about an MBA. Uh, later on, I discovered that. Some people at the university was doing some research and, and told me that I was the first African-American to earn an MBA at the University of Arkansas. Um, but the experiences there uh, shaped and molded me uh, to prepare for life after the University of Arkansas. Um, and at this time, I, I would like for you all, if you have questions, uh, uh, ask them and, and we'll go from there. Anyone have a question? Well, one, one thing that I was thinking about um, listening is, is why, why do you think that your brother kept that from you? And do you think that like keeping that information about the hardships that you were bound to face. But did that, do you think that benefited you or was that like neutral or was that like ultimately like a negative that you weren't able to prepare beforehand? Um, you know, we had, there was a culture uh, coming up when I was a youngster. My parents faced hardships. They faced discrimination. Uh, they faced all of these things and, and they were relegated to the lowest paying jobs relegated to the hardest of labor to try to make it for a family. Not that they didn't have the skills or the will to do things. That's just the way society was. They were relegated to the lowest of the low jobs and the treatment they received on jobs. They never talked about those things with us as children. 
they focused on everything positive. They focused on encouraging us that we could be what we wanted to be if we got an education. So they didn't spend a lot of energy talking about the hardest day in and day out as they went to and from work. So that was a culture. And I'm going to say my brother had that culture. He never talked to me much about the hardships that he faced and the treatment he received at the University of Arkansas. Uh, so never knew until I hit campus. And that's, that's when it hit me. Do you Mayor, oh. go ahead, Luis. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, do you think if he would have shared those hardships with you, it would have changed anything about you attending the university or anything like that? Uh, it very well could have changed things. Uh, being a youngster, I, I would I can imagine him telling me what he went through and then me being able to decide whether or not I could endure that. Um, later on, we talked about it. We, we shared stories of what I experienced and what he experienced. And certainly he experienced much harsher treatment than I did. Uh, he never lived on campus uh, because he couldn't live on campus. He never participated in any extracurricular activities because he couldn't participate in them. Uh, he faced the signs that said colored and white, colored only, white only. He faced all of those things uh, while he was there in Fayetteville. Uh, but he never shared those things with me. And so I would imagine if he would have, I would have gone to the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. In fact, that's where all my buddies went. <laughs> and I really wanted to go there. Uh, but my parents wanted me to go to the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. They felt like that was the best education that our state could offer. And plus it was a little bit closer to home too where they could keep an eye on me. Thank you. So now would you, um, lately from what I hear about my sections of the news, I guess, are a lot of parents are trying to find really innovative ways to talk to their kids about racism because it's just been a long time. So do you think that it's possible for or probable, I guess, for students to talk, not students, for parents to talk to their, their kids about all of that that they went through and that they may still go through today and like to their kids. Because depending on the age, it's, you know, kind of hard. But some people, some people do it some. You know, and, and I, you know, I think, like I said, my parents didn't talk about racism or how difficult it was for them. Um, again, they spent their energy and the time they had to spend with us, uh, encouraging us, educating us, teaching us about what being good means, uh, being good to your neighbors, serving your community. They spent their energy and time uh, talking about these things and made sure we were giving back in the community. Um, they had a, a radical belief uh, in God and so they, that's where their trust was. So th they would often tell us to trust God and, and, and get your education. Whatever it takes, you get your education because no one can ever take that from you. That was, that was a common phrase in, in, in our day. But I think in, in, the, in the battles we fought on campus and won, when things began to change and the university began to recognize um, that times had changed and they began to embrace the African-Americans as full students for, for a long time, we felt like foreigners on the campus. We didn't feel like we were part of the university. We didn't feel like we were part of the student body. We felt like foreigners in a strange land. And, and, but over time, as things began to change, then we felt like we had made some significant strides and accomplishments when, we, when they began to see change, when they began to make sure there was uh, fun field activities that were diverse. They used to have a program, an annual event every year called Gable Lee. 
and they would bring in top-notch acts from all over the country. And because of our, our continuous push, uh, continuous press against what we wanted as students as well, they began to make sure that, that African-American acts began to show up. Uh, believe it or not, we had one of the best Gabalese ever held on that campus when we had James Brown, we had Ike and Tina Turner. All those may be foreign names to you. James were, Brown and Tina Turner were at <laughs> U of A? They were at U of A. James Brown, uh, Ike and Tina Turner, the Barquets, uh, you know, Mitch Rod and the Detroit Wheels. They were all there on that campus. The university I decided, parents, yeah. yeah, the university decided we are where we are. Let's embrace these students. And they began to, <laughs> they began to make sure that there was entertainment. They began to make sure that our voices were heard. Uh, and, and with that, we felt we had crossed some thresholds. We were no longer treated like foreigners. Uh, we began to do things in, on campus. Matter of fact, a good friend and I uh, put together a very uh, a band that became very popular all across the southern region, and we played on campus. Uh, and so we felt that we had crossed some thresholds when it came to being recognized on the campus as full-fledged students. And we began to enjoy campus life. We began, began to enjoy being a Razorback. We begin enjoying everything available to students. Yes, we did cross some thresholds when they began to, when Gerald Jordan uh, responded to a, an article that came out in the Traveler and the Traveler refused to uh, print his response. Well, we took over the press. So if you can't print this response, then you will not print anything else. Uh, we were bold at 18, 19, 20 years old. And we stood in front of the chancellor's, uh, in front of the chancellor's door, doorway and protested. Said it's not fair, it's not just. And they ultimately re relented and printed Gerald's response. Um, and we protested. We, you know, we all had the afros and dashikis and and we were putting up the black power sign and we were doing all of these things uh, to fight for the things that we thought we deserved as students on that campus. Um, so things began to change, but the racism was still in place. The university tried to accommodate us in places they thought would make us comfortable but there was always the challenges in the classroom. A good friend of mine was an architectural student, completed his coursework, had his final project on display, ready to be examined by the professors to determine whether or not he graduated. Today, he was to go in and talk about his project when he arrived in, in the School of Architecture. His project was completely destroyed completely destroyed. And he had to spend an extra year at the University of Arkansas to earn his architectural degree. Those kind of things happened. They happened. But again, I think it shaped and molded. We were determined to stay. We all felt as if the forces were against us to drive us away from the University of Arkansas. But we were determined to stay. We were determined to stay. Any other questions? I guess someone, one of the questions that they had, um, it says, what inspired you to go from education to politics and insurance? <laughs> well, as a, my desire was to be a elementary school teacher, elementary school teacher, because I loved my elementary school teacher. Prettiest lady I'd ever laid eyes on, and I wanted to be a school teacher because of her, uh, and earned my degree in elementary ed. Um, but during the job fairs, uh, one of the companies, one of the big private companies, um, recognized me and gave me an interview. 
Therefore, I never spent a day in the classroom. I went to work for a major company and worked for that company for about eight years. And then one of the vice presidents uh, challenged me on something that I thought was morally incorrect. He asked, I, I ran a department, one of the departments at the corporation, and the vice president of that department asked me to fire five or six people. When he first told me that, I thought he was kidding. He says, McGill, I want you to fire five or six people uh, to prove that you're a strong leader and that, uh, and that would frighten everybody else into doing a good job. Simply didn't make sense to me. I thought he was kidding, so I didn't think anything else about it. About two weeks later, he asked me, who are you going to fire? I said, are you serious? He says, yes. I said, I need all the people that work in my department. He says, well, I know you can replace them in a few weeks. This is Arkansas is a right to work state and you don't have to have a reason to dismiss someone. But I want them to fear you. He says, your leadership style is different from mine. Of course, during that time, I just got, got my MBA and I, I was ready to do all these great things. And he called me in finally and says, who are you going to fire? And I said, I'm, I don't think I can fire anybody. I need those people. He says, well, you're being insubordinate. That means I can fire you. And I decided that I was not going to displace five or six families so he could prove whatever, that I was a tough manager or whatever. And I decided I would take a walk and I felt like I could make it, but I was not about to put five or six families out of work for such a frivolous reason. So I turned my keys in and went away. And um, after taking it easy for about a month, decided to explore other opportunities. And I ended up starting my own business uh, in the financial services and insurance business and built it up. And uh, along the way, politics creeps in. A good friend of mine also went to the University of Arkansas and attended law school there. Carol Willis uh, became a legend in, in Arkansas politics. Uh, he called me up one day and, and said, McGill, uh, I've, and, and I'm going to say it like he would say it. He said, McGill, I've got this boy that's interested in getting politics and he's going to run for office. I said, well, who is that? He said, his name is Bill Clinton. And he was my professor at the law school. He's thinking about getting into politics. Will you help me run his campaign? I said, you know, I'm trying to run a business. I don't have time to get in politics. He says, come on, help me now. He's trusted me to help him build a team. And after a lot of arm twisting, he said, at least come meet the guy anyway. And I had a chance to meet uh, Bill Clinton and, you know, liked the guy. And long story short, I ended up helping him uh, be involved in his very first campaigns and stayed with him throughout uh, his two terms as president. An amazing experience uh, for me to be a part of that, to be front and center, be right there close to all the action, close to all of the decision making, close to all of the strategies and being able to travel all across the United States uh, to support Bill Clinton as, as president. It was interesting when uh, he became governor, uh, after he had gotten elected governor, that following January, he, he calls about 10 or 12 of us who was part of the campaign and called us to the governor's mansion. We couldn't figure out what for. Uh, campaign was already over, people getting ready to go to work for the new term. And he calls us to the governor's mansion. And after brunch, he announced that he wanted to be president of the United States. Of course, my jaw dropped and I'm thinking, First of all, nobody even knows where Arkansas is. And number two, nobody knows, doesn't even know the name of the governor of Arkansas. So there's no way he can win. Long story short, uh, he did win. 
Uh, we campaign all across the country. And for the first time in, in, in big time politics, a presidential campaign gave African Americans free reign to run a campaign uh, targeted toward the minority community. Gave us all the resources we requested, gave us, um, gave us license to travel across the country where we thought necessary, meet the people we thought necessary. Uh, the comments were, I, it, Bill said, I, I think I can win 47, 48% of the white vote. But if you guys go out and turn out a record number of African Americans in this campaign, I can become the president of the United States. And they gave us the freedom to put our own ideas to work. They gave us the freedom to develop our own strategies that we took across the country to work in the African American communities. And we did turn out a record number of African, African Americans during his first campaign, and he did become president. And uh, so that's how I got in involved in politics. Uh, later on, um, ended up serving in the Arkansas legislature uh, for three terms. I served as a deputy pro tem, uh, which is part of the leadership team in the Arkansas House of Representatives. Uh, and I guess uh, that was a, 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 an amazing experience as well. Um. I guess this is a smaller question. I guess I, I put it in the chat too. Which fraternity were you in? You said you and Dr. Jordan were. Yeah, no, we're uh, at university. When we were there, uh, there were no black fraternities on campus. So I, oh. I, I, I became a Kappa. <laughs> I became a Kappa uh, through an alumni chapter. What do you know how to pray? to protest during you know your younger years because there were already so much racism and if you were going to push back did you not think that might be worse outcomes i'll tell you what was interesting when we when we decided to stop the press when they refused to print Gerald's response uh, we decided, well, you won't print anything else. And so we gathered up, it was about 10 or 12 of us, including people from, from Fayetteville in the community, African-Americans who were very active in the community. They came to campus and we just blocked the door to the printing, uh, to the printing office. Now, being 18, 19 years old, uh, you know, we were just kind of bold. And I, as I think about it now, if I know what I know, if I knew then what I know now, I probably never would have stood in front of that place, knowing that the state troopers were on the way. Matter of fact, someone did announce the state troopers are coming to remove you from this building. And we kind of looked at each other, you know, and but we never moved. I guess, again, knowing what I know now, I probably would have fled. Uh, the minute they announced that, but we never moved. We stayed there, and but the state troopers never arrived. Uh, so we we shut down the press for probably a couple of days, and then they relented and and printed Gerald's letter. And so again, um, kind of forced change. Uh, keep in mind during that era, the University of Arkansas was very prominent in in athletics, particularly football. Uh, we were we were one of the top uh, athletic football programs in the country during those years. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Arkansas won a championship uh, my very first year, won the national championship my first year there. Um, and and we had put the word out that if if Arkansas played Dixie, played the song Dixie or wave the rebel flag again, that we were gonna go and stand in the middle of Razorback Stadium, in the middle of the game. And uh, they weren't too sure whether or not we would do it because we were very active around campus with the protests and all. And they never played Dixie again and they never waved the rebel flag again. And so change did take place. Yes, ma'am. You're muted. Hi. Oh. I fixed it. Okay. Hi. Yes. Um, my name is Anna Dooley, and I'm from Fort Smith, actually. So, hello. Okay. Um, Hi, I Fort. I have a question. Um, so, 
something that you said about Dixie really stuck out to me in the reading. Um, and I was wondering, like, since that was such a big deal at the U of A at the time, how do you feel about, like, Southside and that Dixie was played all the way up until 2015 and their rebel being, or their mascot being the rebel, like, how did you kind of come to terms with that, being in your hometown and, like, kind of deal with that? Uh, it's... It, it we know what those symbols and those songs and those traditions represent and they're very painful. It, even as the mayor now, we struggle with some of that stuff. We've got a Confederate statue downtown on the, on the county courthouse lawn and, and for a while they had uh, a Confederate type flag flying over our river front. front. We've taken that Confederate flag down uh, and so the press uh, presses me on questions about those kinds of issues. And my response is always, when I salute a flag, it should mean liberty and justice for all. Anything less than that should not fly over my city. Anything less than that should not fly over this city. Any symbol that means less than that should not stand in our midst. Uh, and so it, people talk about their heritage, their Southern heritage. And, and my question is always, what part of your Southern heritage are you trying to protect or that you are interested in highlighting? Are you referring to the part of your heritage that lynched my people, that starved my people, that chased them down like animals? Is that the part of your heritage you're interested in protecting? Is that part of the heritage that, that, that treated us like animals, less than human beings? And even after the Civil War, instituted Jim Crow laws and other kind of laws that suppressed us and kept us in slavery, even though they said we were free. Is that what you're trying to protect with your symbols and your flags? If not, tell me what part of your heritage that you think is, is good for all of us. What part of the heritage that you're trying to protect it is good for all of us that gives us all a sense of place, gives us all a sense of belonging, gives us all a sense of well-being gives us a sense that we're all included in a positive future. What part of that, where, where, where does that lie when you say, I'm protecting my heritage? And then the voices are silent. So as a mayor, my, my task is to make sure, I'm the, I'm the number one cheerleader with the city of Fort Smith. And my task is to make sure that the things I say and the things I do highlight this city as a welcoming place for anyone that chooses to come here. That means any race, creed, color, or religion is my job to make sure they understand they are welcome here. For any industry that wants to come here, we're gonna, we're gonna embrace our employees of every race, creed, and color. Uh, we're looking at, uh, we're in the mix for a, a major Air Force project here in Fort Smith. Uh, the Air Force is, is, is looking at five Air Force bases, and they're going to select one to house a, a training mission for uh, some of our allies around the world. We're going to be training uh, Singapore pilots uh, and pilots from two or three other countries. Uh, they're going to be training them on the weaponry that we sell them, the F-16 and the F-35 fighter planes. And they are in the process of selecting an air base to house this training mission. And one of the things that those selectors, those generals and officers look at, they said, all of these bases will have the basics to house this mission. They will have a long runway. They will have uh, a site for uh, live firing of the weapons that come on these airplanes. And they will have all the other things. They will have the 
radio, they'll have everything in place. The deciding factor will be the community in which we put this mission. What is that community like? Is it welcoming? We're going to be sending foreign people. We're going to be sending foreign pilots there to live and train. How will your community embrace them? How will you treat them? Uh, we had people from the Mitsubishi company uh, come to Fort Smith and they, they built a facility here. And I asked uh, one of the Japanese executives, I asked, why did you choose Fort Smith? And he told me, he says, we did our due diligence, due diligence in, in, in site selecting and a couple of things that stood out. He said, Fort Smith has a trained and trainable workforce and its diversity. I said, explain that to me. He says, how well you treat people that look different? How well you treat the minority communities, how that diverse community you have, how are they received? How do they fit in? How comfortable are they in your city? He said, that was as much as important as anything else. Certainly your city is centrally located in the United States, great climate uh, and all of these things. He says, but your trained and trainable workforce and your diversity. And the Air Force people are looking at, at our culture, how we treat people, what we say about ourselves. So my challenge as the mayor is to encourage everybody to be careful what we say about Fort Smith, Arkansas. I mean, you can get angry because the grass is a little high in the park but don't blow it up on Facebook. So it's all over the world. Uh, certainly we, we experience things like any other city. Keep in mind, whatever you say about yourself could be used against you. And I try to encourage our citizens to be careful what you say about your hometown because it could be used against us when it comes to uh, decisions about new sites for new manufacturing, uh, possibly a new mission for the United States Air Force. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So, um, it's kind of related to that topic. I'm from Greenwood. Uh huh. You're my neighbor. Yeah. And so, over the summer, it, like all 50 states experienced protests, and witnessing that in Fort Smith firsthand, like, what changes do you think that might have brought to Fort Smith? Like, the protests that took place within the city? Uh, let me, uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that particular question. Certainly there were protests all over the country and Fort Smith was no different in that we had five protests here um, that, was, that were, that was caused by the death of George Floyd. Uh, we had five protests, but because of our method of policing, we talk about community-based policing. That is where our officers build a strong relationship in the communities where they patrol. In other words, they don't just go in a community because they're called because something has happened. They go in those communities to build relationships with the people who live and reside there. So as a consequence, when something does happen, the people in the neighborhoods know the officers when they arrive and they've built great friendships and relationships with them. So how did that play out when we had the protests? The way it played out, Never once did our police department ever have to put on riot gear, wear a riot helmet, or they never deployed smoke bombs, tear gas, or anything else like that. As a matter of fact, I made sure that all the protesters had snow cones at the end of the rally. So again, community-based policing, thinking, forward thinking. So it really made a difference when the protests came about, uh, the young people who organized the protests because of the relationship they had with our police force, the first things that they would do was call the police department and notify them that we're gonna have a rally. And then they would collaborate and coordinate the rally with the police department. The police department would ask them, how many people do you think you're gonna have at your rally? They would give them a number. Then that would help the police department determine how many officers they would need 
to make sure that they were all protected. Uh, our police officers were there on the scene. Um, they participated with the young people. They prayed with the protesters uh, and they engaged with them in a very, very positive way. Never once did our police department have to tell someone to back up, don't do something. Uh, they became part of the protest. In fact, uh, all of the major police um, officials in the area, the chief of police in Fort Smith, Van Buren, the, the county sheriffs, they all signed a proclamation that they gave to the Black Lives Matter organization. They signed a proclamation stating that everyone could promise that they were going to be treated fairly and they were going to be supportive of anyone that was interested in keeping peace and creating harmony in our community. So that was their pledge to the Black Lives Matter group, that we're going to make sure that we make sure that we perform well, that you'll be pleased, be pleased with the kind of policing we're going to do in this area. And uh, and that's the that's the way it's been. So we're very pleased. I spoke to the governor about the protests and, and riots in, in Little Rock. They, that was major damage in Little Rock. We experienced none of that here in Fort Smith, Arkansas. So I was very proud of our young people who organized the protests, very proud of our police departments uh, for how they joined in and supported those that were protesting. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you think we have come a long way in terms of the university changing compared to when you were a student? Oh God, <laughs> absolutely. University has come a long way. Matter of fact, when, when I graduated, um, there were several of us vowed to never set foot back on that campus. That was a promise we made to one another. Said, man, once this is over, they will never have to worry about seeing us again. That has come full circle. The university have, has embraced all of us who graduated from that institution. They recognize us in, in many, many ways to show their appreciation for how we handle things and show their appreciation for the fact that we chose that university. Uh, matter of fact, the University of Arkansas has recognized me on several occasions. Uh, School of Business recognized me as, as an outstanding public servant. Uh, they invited me back to speak to the uh, honors class of the School of Business graduation um, and invited back by some of the chancellors that have been there before. So they have embraced all of us. Uh, and so uh, a good friend of mine, um, uh, got to, we got together and created a scholarship. Never did think I'd create a scholarship for the University of Arkansas, but partnered with a major corporation. A friend of mine was CEO of, at the time. And over a five year period, uh, he made sure I had close to a million dollars to give out scholarships to young people um, of diverse backgrounds to attend the University of Arkansas full circle from, from a time I said I'd never go back to actually being involved in raising scholarship dollars for young people to attend my alma mater. Any other questions? Uh, you talked some about uh, working on uh, working with Bill Clinton. Yes. Um, and and one of the things you so and you talked about you talked about um, you and um, and other minority leaders going out and uh, helping Bill Clinton win you know large swaths of their support um, and their votes. Um, and I was wondering if you think that that ultimately paid off, like if if your vote was ultimately earned, right? Uh, and like, cause the thing that the, when I think of like Bill Clinton in, in, in relation to like race, I think of like the 1994 crime bill, which implemented mm -hmm. a lot of these measures that, that are in large part a reason why like the federal prison population mm -hmm. is, is more than a third, is, is the male prison population is comprised of more than a third um, black people, even though they only make a little bit uh, 
uh, more than like a tenth of the national population, for instance. Uh, you know, that the, the crime bill is 1994. And of course, we're talking in the 70s when when we got aboard his bandwagon. Yeah. And uh, uh, at the time, his message was one of unity, one of inclusion, may have used different terms, but one of inclusion um, and opportunity. Uh, keep in mind, when, when Bill was president, president, the Secretary of the Army was an African-American. Secretary of Commerce was an African-American. Secretary of Transportation was Arkansan, uh, Rodney Slater. Um, the White House Personnel Director was an African-American, Bob Nash. The White House hist historian, African-American, also a U of A graduate, uh, Janice Kearney at the time. Her name is Janice Nash. So Bill had a, a large representation of African-Americans in his administration. Um, and so he, 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 he made the promises that he would be inclusive in his administration and he made sure that that happened. Politics change over time, the pressure to do something with the lawless, lawlessness that was happening at the time, the crime, extraordinary crime rates in some of these big cities uh, simply led to some legislation that over time proved to be wrong. And he has many times since uh, stated how much he regretted that. In it. Yes, sir. As a politician, what what one work are you most proud of that you have done in your career? Um, I it most my my best work was done in the House of Representatives. Certainly, I, I brag about all the things that we do in Fort Smith, uh, but most of it centers around uh, the grit that we've had uh, had to have to survive some of the tragedies that we've faced. We had a record breaking flood in nineteen in twenty nineteen. Uh, that really almost devastated our city. And my challenge as the mayor was to keep a, a calming sense uh, in the city uh, to make sure all of the essential services worked in an, ex in an extraordinary way. Uh, uh, you, you prove yourself in the time of an emergency. So my goal was to make sure that all of our essential services performed at a high level during that that flood crises. So the way we did that was recognized around the country uh, as, as we brought together, as we practiced what I call management 101. Uh, it starts with listening. We had to listen to all the leaders of the various departments and agencies that deal with flooding and disaster. Number two, we, we began to share with one another what our role would be in dealing with the disaster. And then we began to collaborate and communicate and again, carry out the fundamentals of good leadership. And as a result of that, we had the best outcome that you could expect when dealing with a record-breaking flood. Um, that's your enforcement. I, I take a lot of, uh, feel real good about how I managed and, and led that effort. Uh, when I was in the Arkansas House of Representatives, at one time, Arkansas was one of only three states that that recognized Robert E. Lee's birthday on the same day as Martin Luther King Jr. That's confusing to people when they would go to the Capitol and the Capitol would be closed and on one door it says closed in honor of Robert E. Lee and on the other door it says closed in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, conflicting messages from two different men that believed in uh, complete opposites on, on race and uh, uh, Governor Hutchinson asked me to speak on the House floor to assist him in passing legislation that would convince uh, the House of Representatives to vote for the separation of those holidays. They had they attempted it in the past. But again, a lot of people hold on to their Southern heritage. And many of my colleagues would say, don't disturb my heritage. When you move his holiday, that's like relegating us to someplace where nobody knows. We know when we celebrate his birthday, we celebrate it on this day. They were not recognizing Martin Luther King's birthday, they were recognizing Robert E. Lee's day. 
and they would take that national holiday for Martin Luther King and take off and celebrate Robert E. Lee. Uh, the governor wanted to change that because of a reflection, a negative reflection on the image of our state. And so he pushed legislation and uh, in politics, they count votes. On when, when an issue gets tough, the sponsor begins to count votes. Basically, they will call everyone in that voting body and ask how they are going to vote. Uh, some will say one way or the other. Some will say, I'm voting against, I'm voting for. Uh, the night before the vote was taken, the governor's office called me and said, we don't think it's gonna pass. We can only count 46 votes at this time and they needed 51 to pass it. So we can count, we've called all the legislators more than once and most of them have, have made a decision and we can we count only 46 votes and this legislation is gonna fail. Would you speak? Would you go to the house floor and convince your colleagues <clears throat> that this is the right thing to do for our state? And after being, you know, just kind of thinking about it, it, it kind of bothered me in the sense that uh, I said, this Robert E. Lee stuff is not my problem. You guys created this situation, you fix it. And after another call from the governor's office, I gave a consideration and the following day I did go before the house and speak for the separation. And the votes changed and we did, uh, we did pass that legislation, which was huge for our state. Any other questions? Mayor, we thank you so much for the, the, the history, the, the, the time, the, and your commitment to social justice and equal opportunity throughout your, your career. And uh, it's been a great learning opportunity for me, and, and I'm sure I speak for the other students. So thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. Well, let me, let me say to all of you, embrace your University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. You'll forever be associated with it. When you get your degree, it's going to have that name on it. Embrace that and be proud of it. Uh, you've got a great institution there. It's evidenced by uh, them appointing uh, Dr. Robinson to his new post. Uh, and, and don't be ashamed to tell people you went to the University of Arkansas. Now we can talk about the football team at another time. <laughs> but, 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 but for the University of Arkansas itself and what it now stands for, uh, you should be proud. And I've come full circle. At one time I said I'd never go back but now I enjoy going back every opportunity I get. And I'm very proud to say I'm an alumni of the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. Thank all of you for giving me an opportunity to visit with you. If you ever enforce me, call the mayor's office. I'll give you the grand poobah tour. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. We appreciate okay. you. Thank you, Thanks. I'm honored with the mayor. Okay, thank